All right, so let's see here. We want to show that if we have a set C that is content zero, then it is contained in some closed rectangle, and C is Jordan measurable, and the integral of the indicator function is zero. Okay, so let's see here. So we want to prove that it's contained in some closed rectangle A. So basically what that means is we want to prove that it's a bounded set. So we know that C has content zero. Um, so we know that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a U, a collection U1 through UN of, of these are uh, closed rectangles such that C is contained in the union from I equals one to N of UI. And if we sum, and I'll just put the sum over all I of the, if we sum the volumes, this is less than epsilon. Um, having, um, chosen an epsilon and a cover u1 through un um, this cover is contained in a closed rectangle A. And so how do we know that? Basically, you've got a whole bunch of rectangles and basically all I'm saying is that you can take this finite number of rectangles and put it in a, uh, set these rectangles inside one largest rectangle. And um, you can actually build such a rectangle for yourself. I, this might have been an exercise that I did a while ago or it was um, something that I chose to go into details on in an exercise. But basically, you've got these rectangles U1 through UN, um, and each rectangle has like some, it's a direct product of uh, closed intervals. And you just take all of these sets, and um, let's see here, so for the first coordinate, what you do is you look at the, you look at the, um, what are the possible um, intervals of the first coordinate over all of the UIs, and then you just take the smallest number there as your left and left endpoint, and the largest number as your right endpoint. Um, and so there you go. That's how you choose the interval for the first coordinate. And then for each coordinate, you do the same thing. Um, and then what you'll end up with is you'll end up with the direct product of closed intervals. Um, which gives you a closed rectangle and it will contain all of the UIs because um, it was chosen in that way. Um, and, and also like, uh, that's, that's more the mathematical symbolic argument. You, you can sort of think of this visually like it makes sense. If you, if you draw a couple rectangles here, then of course you can find a largest rectangle that you, um, put around the outside of all of them. And in fact, if you want to go through this argument um, that I did in the, in the first, um, in the first coordinate, you would find the leftmost endpoint and the rightmost endpoint. And in the second coordinate, you'd find the, or second coordinate, yeah, you find the leftmost endpoint and the rightmost endpoint. And then you use those, let's see here. So I guess it would be more like, you'd go like this, and that would be your rectangle A. Um, anyways, so that tangent over, um, let's continue. So we can bound this in a rectangle A. Um, so obviously then C is contained in A um, because C is contained in the closed cover, which is contained in A. All right, um, so that's, that's that part. Um, next, we must prove that C is Jordan measurable. Let's prove 
that C is Jordan measurable. And what does that mean? That means that the boundary has measure zero. And I will write that as mu of the boundary of C equals zero. And I've talked about this before, but this mu of a set is sort of the measure theoretic notation that you use to refer to the measure of the set. Because a measure is a function where you feed in a set and you it returns a number. Um, anyway, so we're proving that the measure of the boundary is zero. Um, so let's see, how do we do that? Um, given any epsilon greater than zero, um, choose u1 through un as before. All right. Um, so c is going to be contained in the union of the uis, and the sum of the volumes of the uis will be less than epsilon. Okay, so what we have is the boundary of u. Well, this is going to be contained in the closure of the set C because, see, I'm pretty sure this is something that's brought up in this textbook, but the boundary of a set is equal to the closure of the set. You take the closure of the set and remove the interior of the set, and that gives you the boundary. So in particular, um, the boundary of a set is contained in the closure. Well, you can even, like, so the closure of a set is defined, or one way to define it is, um, it's the set, you take the union of the set with its boundary and that gives you the closure. So of course the boundary of C is going to be contained in the closure of C. Okay, so boundary of C is contained in the closure of C. And so C is contained in the union of the UIs. So the closure of C is contained in the closure of the union of the UIs. And now I believe this was an exercise way back in the textbook. Um, but if you've got a finite union of UIs and you're taking the closure, this is the same as taking the union from i equals 1 to n of the closure of the UIs. But of course the UIs are all closed rectangles and so the closure of a closed set is itself, is that, is that something that's discussed in this textbook? It's really weird because there's a lot of very, so this whole like boundaries and closures and stuff, this is all like point set topology, which is usually covered pretty in depth in an analysis course. But in this textbook, it's not covered very much in detail. They only give you like the bare minimum that you need to move forward in the textbook, which I guess is good with this being an introductory textbook to more abstract in a more abstract mathematically rigorous approach to calculus um, and anyway I'm just going to assume that you sort of know these things and if you don't you can look them up somewhere else and try to prove them on your own um, which is something I'm sure you hate hearing if this applies to you but I mean I don't have a an easier way to do it um, on my own. And once you know all these tricks, they become really easy to use. Anyways, so the union of the closures of these sets, because, they, because the, they're closed sets, the closure of a closed set is itself. So this is precisely equal to the union from i equals 1 to n of ui. All right, so so the ui's are a um, cover of delta C. Well, I guess w what I'm saying is, um, so we have a cover of the, so the boundary of C is covered by these UIs and the UIs um, all have total volume less than epsilon. Um, So the boundary of C can be covered by a set or by a collection 
of closed rectangles whose volumes sum to a value less than epsilon. I'm sure there's a better way to phrase that, but I'll just write that. Um, but anyways, so that's exactly what it means to have a set of measure zero, at least in this um, textbook. Um, that's how it's defined, is that a set has measure zero if, um, given any epsilon, you can find a covering of that set by rectangles whose total uh, volume is less than epsilon. Um, so this means that the measure of the boundary of C equals zero. Okay, so there we go. Um, so let's see here. So C is, is Jordan measurable, and now we need to prove that the integral of the indicator function is zero. So um, let's see, we, we've got that the boundary is zero. Um, so then by theorem 3-9, um, the indicator function chi of chi c is integrable, and I'll just write it like this. Okay, um, let's see here. I guess in what I'm about to do, I guess we don't really need to know that because we're going to compute the integral um, anyways. Yeah, so I guess that's that's a little um, unnecessary here, but I'll keep it because it's a true statement. But a lot of mathematically, I guess it's not good to keep something that's redundant. Um, but anyways, to compute this integral, the integral over a of this characteristic function. Um, Fix any epsilon greater than zero and choose u1 through un as before. Um, all right, so we've got a collection of closed rectangles. Um, that cover C. And they're the sum of the volumes of these rectangles is less than epsilon. Um, so then um, partition this collection, I'm just now realizing that I need this, um, into um, disjoint rectangles V1 through Vm which are disjoint. So basically what we're doing is we're taking this um, this finite cover of C and we want to make a partition of A the entire rectangle out of that. Um, however, what you need to do is, I looked this over in the solution that I wrote up, but you need to um, account for the fact that these u1 through un could overlap, and so you need to account for that. And basically, um, I think I talked about this in another exercise as well, um, but basically you can do this. You, if you've got um, some rectangles, you can partition them into a subcollection so that they don't overlap. And so the, the, the visual idea here behind why you're able to do this is, let's say you've got one rectangle here and one rectangle here. Then what you can do is you can sort of break this up. Um, and so what would this look like? Let me see if I can, nope, that is not what I wanted to do. Let me try to, nope, nope, try to copy and paste this. Mm. Copy. 
paste. All right. So what we want to do with this is you basically you make this a rectangle and then you make this a rectangle, then you make this a rectangle, then let me get rid of everything else here. And then you make this rectangle and then you make this rectangle and then you've broken it up. So basically because these rectangles inter the intersection of a rectangle with a rectangle if they overlap is going to be another rectangle. Um, and the remaining um, things that did not overlap could be broken up into rectangles. Um, and so by that logic, we can take this partition U1 through UN and um, break it up and force it to be disjoint um, into V1 through Vm. So each V, so M is going to be greater than or equal to N. Um, each VI is going to be contained in some UJ. Um, um, obviously, because the union of the UIs is the same as the union of the VJs, um, C is going to be contained in the union of the VJs. Also, the volume, the sum of the volumes of the VJs is going to be the same as the sum of the volumes of the UIs. In fact, it's, well, since they don't overlap anymore, I guess it could be even smaller. Um, because if the UIs overlap, then um, that overlap could be counted multiple times. Um, which are this point and so they satisfy C is contained in the union from J equals 1 through M of EJ and the sum over all J's of the volume of EJ is going to be less than epsilon because it's going to be strictly less than the sum of or it's going to be less than or equal to the sum of the volumes of the UIs, which is going to be which is less than epsilon by how we chose the UIs. Okay, so then let P equals. So this is we're going to take V one through V M. So this is going to partition part of A, but then you need to partition the rest of A into um, rectangle, so we'll take W1 through WK. Um, and again, sort of by these similar visual arguments, it should be clear that you can um, partition the remainder of the space into rectangles. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Okay, so anyways, we've got this. So now let's compute the upper sum of the indicator function given the partition P. So this is the thing that we um, talk a lot in the, about in the first section of this chapter. Um, so anyways, so this is going to be the sum. So you have to sum over all the VIs, or yeah, so sum from I equals one to M of VI. And what you have to do is you have to take the maximum value or the, the yeah, the supremum over the set VI of the function chi of C times the volume of VI. And that's the formula. And you have to take the sum over all sets in the partition P. So this is taking the sum over all of the, over V1 through VM. And now we need the Ws as well. So we'll take K equals one through, no, I equals one through M, J equals one through K of M W J times V W J. All right, so what is this going to be? So the sum, so what is the maximum value of V I? What's the maximum value of chi C on the set V I? What is the supremum going to be? Well, we know that, um, well, the indicator function chi of C um, is going to be, it, it, it's indicator functions take on the value of zero, one. So it can be at most one. So it'd be the sum from I equals one through M of one times the volume of V I. Plus you got the sum. Now, what is the maximum value of W J? Oh, I'm missing an argument here. So this would be WJ of chi C times 
v of w j. Okay, what's the maximum value, or what's the supremum of all values of uh, x? All, all, what's the supremum of all values in wj of chi of c? Well, let's see here. V1 through Vm cover C. So anything that's in C needs to be in one of the Vi's. So if you've got some if you've got a set that's in one of the WJ's, then it's not in any of the VI's, so it doesn't intersect with C at all. So the indicator function has to be zero. So this sum completely drops out because this first factor here, the M W J Chi C is always zero because this because um, because chi c is always zero on the set w j because w j does not intersect with c. All right, so this sum is all we have here, and so what happens when we take the sum of the v volumes of the vi's? Well, we know that this is less than epsilon. Okay, so. The up, oh, so we have a part, we found a partition. Um, let's actually, let's call this partition P epsilon. Um, so, if we take the infimum over all partitions P of U, K, C, P epsilon, well, that's going to be less than or equal to what we do when we take the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the upper sum evaluated at epsilon. Okay, so there should not be an epsilon there. Um, and so then this is less than epsilon. So this infimum of this upper sum must be zero. Because it's always going to be, ooh, wait, do we know that? No. It's going to be less than or equal to zero. Okay. Now, clearly, and that's a, um, talk about the su supremum overall P of the lower sum of chi C P. Well, this is certainly going to be positive because um, the function chi is always positive. Um, and so I guess here um, we are actually using the fact that I, or I am going to use the fact that um, um, chi c is integrable. Um, because what we could do is we could prove that, um, like it could be, if, if we don't know already that it's integrable, it could be the case that the, um, oh wait, no, we know that the um, supremum of, okay, no, this should not be U, this should be L, the lower sum, okay. Um, we know that given any partition, um, okay, okay, I'm, there, there's a, Let's slow down here. So let's first, okay, so I say clearly this is true. Let's argue this. So the lower sum, given any partition, oh, right, I talked about that already. Because um, chi c is going to be always positive, so the min is always going to be positive, so um, yeah, the supremum there. Okay. Well, do you know what? I'm just going to use, I'm going to use the fact that's integrable to make my life easier here. Um, I, I think there is a result um, that any lower sum is always going to be below any upper sum. Um, but I, I, would ha I would have to double check that. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's like one of the first things we, we proved in this section. And I should have that on the top of my head. Um, but I don't. Um, but anyways, so clearly this supremum is this. So the integral over A of chi C equals zero because 
the supremum of the lower sums is greater than or equal to zero, and the infimum of the upper sums is less than or equal to zero. And we know, so we can get this conclusion by two ways. Either what we do is we use the fact from theorem 3-9 that we know that the function chi c is integrable. And so that means that the infimum of the upper sums must be equal to the supremum of the lower sums. Um, and so the only way for that to be true is for both of them to be zero, which means that the integral is zero. Um, now, I don't think we need to use that. I think there is some fact from the beginning of the section where any lower sum is always less than or equal to any upper sum. And just from that alone, given that the infimum of the upper sums is less than or equal to zero and the supremum of the lower sums is greater than or equal to zero, that should automatically give you that the integral is zero. But however you want to do it, we end up with the fact that the integral is zero. Um, and so that finishes the exercise. Um, but there is one interesting thing here that sort of tripped me up when I was first going through this problem, is that um, this isn't necessarily, so we've, we, we prove that the boundary of um, C has measure zero. And this sort of bugged me at first, like I was worried about how I was going to go about doing this, because interestingly, this fact, I don't know if this is discussed in this, oh wait, no, it's discussed in the next section. Um, but basically, no, or not section, but problem. The next problem, I'm going to sort of dive into this idea a little bit. But you can have a set of measure zero whose boundary does not have measure zero. Um, for example, take the rational numbers. The rational numbers are a set of measure zero because given any epsilon, you can order the rationals from, you can take an ordering of the rationals. So you've got your first rational, your second rational, your third rational, etc. You take the first rational number cover it by an interval of length epsilon times one half, take the second rational, um, enclose it in an interval of length epsilon times a fourth, and for the ith rational, you encapsulate it in an interval of length epsilon times two to the minus i minus one. And if you, what you get is you get an infinite collection of closed intervals which covers the rationals and the sum of the lengths of the intervals is epsilon. So the boundary of the rationals has measure zero. However, any neighborhood and any any open interval on the real line contains a rational. So basically every real well no every every inner every open interval on the real line contains both a rational and an irrational number. So every point is contained in the boundary of the rationals. So the boundary of the rational numbers, it, well, the closure of the rational numbers is the real line. But yeah, um, the rational numbers don't have an interior. Oh yeah, of course, by the argument I gave. Uh, the boundary of the rational numbers is the entire real line. And of course, the real line doesn't have measure zero. Um, so what goes, so I was like, what goes wrong in this argument? And it's, um, where is it? It's here, it's that equality. The fact, we use this equality that if you've got a union, uh, if you've got a finite collection of sets, the closure of a finite union is equal to a un the union of the closures. So if you take the closure of a union of finite sets, that's equal to the union of the closures of the finite sets. I think this is an exercise we did. But this is not true when you talk about countable unions. Um, if you've got an infinite union, and a countably infinite union, um, then the closure of the union contains the union of the closures. However, the closure of the unions could contain things that are not contained in the union of the closures. Um, just for a good example of this, just um, think about like you can have a, a set of points which are converging to zero. Like take the set of points one over n. Um, 
uh, n goes from 1 to infinity. So you've got 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, etc. So the closure of this set, of course it contains all of those numbers of the form 1 over n, but it also contains 0 because um, 0 is um, any neighborhood of 0 has a value, has a point, uh, ha every neighborhood of 0 contains a number of the form 1 over n. Um, so it's in the closure. However, um, zero is not contained in any of those points, so zero is not in the union of the closures of those points. Um, but anyways, so this is um, so this this equality here. This is uh, really important. Um, the fact that we have equality and not just containment in a direction that wouldn't be useful for us. Um, and so we have this fact here that um, the boundary of a set of content zero has measure zero, but the boundary of a set has of measure zero could have, as we see with the rational numbers, it could have infinite measure, um, if that is a thing that you are able to define. Um, anyways, that's just sort of a neat thing about this problem. Um, way back a couple minutes ago, we proved um, we finished proving all of the results necessary for this problem, and so we are done.